What's good? It's Wu. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. We have Gennady Glovkin, also known as Triple G. 41 wins, one loss, and one draw. Defending his IBF middleweight belt against Ryota Murata. 16 wins and two losses. And Murata is defending his WBA super middleweight title not super middleweight as in super middleweight the division 168 but super middleweight as in the super belt not the regular belt and it's kind of weird Ryota Murata is one of those champs who I kind of view as not that he's an illegitimate champ if you win a belt you win a belt but I don't all belts aren't won equally. Sometimes you have to beat the man to be the man, and that is one way to become a champ. Other times you could find like a vacant title opportunity against somebody else who might or might not be elite or world class. All kinds of paths to the titles. But, you know, if you look at Ryota Murata's body of work, he never struck me as being a truly elite fighter. He's a good fighter. I mean, he's got wins over Hassan Endum. I mean, that's actually how he won the WBA middleweight belt, believe it or not. But I never put him in a class, for instance, with Gennady Glovkin, who, you know, there are a lot of things that you can say about the legacy of Triple G and how the story is going to tell itself over the years once Triple G retires. He turns 40 years old, and he's obviously trying to get the, the most juice out of the squeeze out of these last couple fights of his career before he rides off into the sunset and he is now selected as one of Canelo's next two opponents so Canelo's about to fight Dimitri Bivol for a share of the 175 pound light heavyweight belt Bivol is currently the WBA champion over there and then he's going to come back in September, assuming all goes well with Canelo and Bivol and assuming Triple G handles business against Ryota Murata. Canelo is then going to come back down most likely to 168 and will make Triple G come up a division because Triple G spent his whole career at, at middleweight, 160. But they would basically have that trilogy fight in September, assuming again Canelo wins against Bivol and Triple G wins against Murata. Now, it's kind of funny, like Triple G, people who have watched Triple G, you know, have either seen him from around the time he fought Canelo onward, which really isn't much. That's basically just the last few years. But a lot of boxing fans watched that whole stretch that he had when he was fighting on HBO, basically just running roughshod on the middleweight division. Although there are a couple of opponents that he probably should have fought in some capacity that he never ended up fighting, like uh, Billy Joe Saunders. There were instances where that fight was nearly made, or another one would have been uh, Peter Quill and Kid Chocolate. You know, he was undefeated at the time and one of the best fighters at middleweight, but him and Triple G never fought. It ended up being Daniel Jacobs that knocked out Kid chocolate to take that O away from him and you know Triple G became champion back in like 2010 when he beat Milton Nunez believe it or not that's how Triple G earned the his first share of the middleweight title which was the WBA middleweight belt and it was a first round knockout but that belt was then considered the interim champion, and it wasn't until he defended it in his next fight against Nilsson Tapia that he was elevated to a regular champion by the WBA. And it was that belt that he defended successfully for the next few years, along with the IBO title, which most you know don't really consider one of the four major belts. It might be like the fifth or something, but it's not one of the four major belts. But Triple G had that WBA belt for through several defenses. Like his second uh, defense was against Kasim Uma. And Triple G actually had some trouble with Kasim Uma and the way that Kasim Uma was kind of staying in Triple G's chest, throwing a lot of volume. And Triple G ended up stopping Uma like in the 10th round. But that was kind of a difficult fight. And then it was shortly after that, that HBO started carrying his fights. So this was like well into his title reign that we started seeing him pop up on HBO, just dismantling opponents like Gabriel Rosado, Nabu Ishida, Matthew Macklin, Curtis Stevens, uh, Daniel Gill, Marco Antonio Rubio, where he hit Rubio like on the front of the forehead and dropped him with that punch. I think that was ended up being the fight finishing punch. So you see this 
this, you know, several years of dominance where the Triple G is defending this belt successfully. And it wasn't actually until that Rubio fight um, that was like four years later. That was 2014. Remember, he first won the belt in 2010. So he unifies another belt when he fights Marco Antonio Rubio by capturing the WBC interim belt. And then he defends those two belts successfully against like Martin Murray and Willie Monroe Jr. And then he fights David Lemieux, who at that time held the share of the, he held the IBF belt. So then that's when Glufkin was then the WBA uh, champion, WBC champion, and then then IBF champion by beating David Lemieux, who was, you know, he was a knockout artist. David Lemieux is about to be David Benavidez's next opponent. Now, David Lemieux is a lot older now, but yeah, he got dropped with a body punch in the middle rounds against Triple G. This ended up being a pretty big fight. It was at Madison Square Garden, so this was a major event. Before this, Triple G was more or less fighting on like HBO, HBO. I believe this might have been Triple G's first pay-per-view headlining fight and yeah he stopped the dangerous powerful look at what David Lemieux did to Curtis Stevens if you want to see a scary knockout Triple G finish David Lemieux in the eighth round and so you by the time you get here we're in 2015 so he's now a five-year champion and you know he never fought this one guy named Dmitry Pirog. Dmitry Pirog for a long time was the only guy to have beaten Daniel Jacobs who had only that one loss on his record for several years until he fought Triple G like in 2017 or 2016. And Dmitry Pirog was supposed to be, you know, the other very good fighter who was supposed to be matched up with a prime, like we're talking late 20s, early 30s, Triple G. But back injuries led to Dmitry Pirog retiring a young, undefeated champion. So that fight, which I think would have bolstered Triple G's legacy even more, that fight never happened. So, you know, Triple G goes on to have this monstrous run where, again, he's just killing it on HBO. He's just getting featured in headlining fight after headlining fight, basically beating a lot of B-level fighters. Like, that's the unfortunate part about the legacy of Triple G is that he's beating a bunch of B to C-level contenders, but not the other guys who you would consider the class of the division. That was until he had that showdown against Daniel Jacobs in 2017 because just before that, Triple G's reputation was such that he was so feared and at the same time, one of the best welterweights in the game. Kell Brook was also, he felt he was being avoided and couldn't secure the big fights when he was the IBF champ at welterweight after he beat Sean Porter for the title. So here you had a welterweight Kell Brook. This is just before Kell Brook got stopped by Errol Spence late in their fight where Errol Spence captured his first title at welterweight. Well, Kell Brook went up two divisions to fight Triple G and he looked good in the first couple rounds, but you've got a welterweight fighting a middleweight. What could go wrong, right? Well, Triple G by the end of this fight, which only lasted five rounds, for as good and as promising as those early rounds were looking for Kell Brook, Kell Brook walked away from this fight with Triple G with a broken orbital bone and would then go on to suffer another broken orbital bone to the other side when he fought Errol Spence. So those back-to-back -back fights, in my opinion, totally derailed Kell Brook's career. Just disastrous results in otherwise very brave challenges. So yeah, Triple G ended up crushing Kell Brook. He never dropped him in the fight. They ended up having to throw in the towel because Kell Brook's such a tough dude. He was getting hit by those fourth and fifth rounds where it was started to look kind of ugly. He started to get back, you know, backed up into the ropes and just getting beat on. His corner basically saved him. And so Triple G then fought Daniel Jacobs and beat him via, I would say, very close. But to me, you, uh, this uh, look it's one of those that you can make an argument f either way you can make an argument for triple g an argument for a draw or even an argument for daniel jacobs but if you have to squint to make the argument for the other guy then you can't really get mad at triple g winning that fight i thought that it was a well-deserved 115 ish to 113 ish type of win for Triple G. Unanimous decision win. That was a very difficult fight for Triple G. Not that he got bludgeoned or just beaten super badly, but just in terms of the competitiveness of the fight, it was a very close one. And then Triple G finally has 
his first fight with Canelo Alvarez, which a lot of Triple G fans wanted this fight a couple years sooner because we had seen Canelo start flirting with the middleweight division against uh, Miguel Cotto, against Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., who was fighting at weight classes above that, and then they had some catchweight deal because Chavez Jr. can never make weight, whatever the weight is. You can make a fight with Chavez Jr. at 190, and he will probably blow away. He's just that unprofessional. But we wanted to see Triple G versus Canelo Alvarez. Canelo Alvarez, by this point, only had that one loss, you know, to Floyd Mayweather, which is still his only loss to this day. And most who had been watching both fighters for years would have definitely favored Triple G to beat Canelo and not only beat Canelo but probably by stoppage. I thought Triple G was going to stop Canelo Alvarez here. I wasn't totally sold on Canelo Alvarez at middleweight, which hell, he, he's now done what he's done at 168. But when you look at this fight and you examine Canelo versus Triple G1 and the fact that this fight was ruled a draw which then led into their rematch where Canelo tested positive for the clenbuterol. You know, he had to take his suspension. Gennady Glovkin, in the interim, fought Vanis Matarosian, a 154 guy, and just, oh, that fight probably should have never happened. Hats off to Matarosian, a f uh, former title contender, multiple-time title contender. Hats off to him for taking that fight, but that fight probably should have never happened. He knocked Matarosian out in devastating fashion by the second round. And then he has the fight, the second fight with Canelo Alvarez. But in that first fight, I thought Gennady Glovkin deserved a decision win. Yes, Canelo Alvarez, to me, overachieved and overperformed. He, he exceeded my expectation. But exceeding expectation isn't the same as fighting somebody to a draw. Now, I thought as I'm watching the fight, like, damn, Canelo Alvarez looks like he's winning some of these early rounds, which he did. But when you get to the middle and late rounds, I really felt that Gennady Glovkin kind of took over the fight, started asserting himself more. Canelo started looking more tired, started pot shotting more, where he would throw two or three punches and basically start marching to the other side of the ring to buy himself some time, would start spending a little too much time on the ropes, where Gennady Glovkin started to take control. But I still... Even though I thought Gennady Glovkin won that first fight, that, again, was ruled a split draw, I, I still didn't see Gennady, Gennady Glovkin landing those, those most significant punches that we were so accustomed to Glovkin landing throughout this whole era of the Triple G title reign at middleweight. I didn't see him landing flush right hands or flush left hooks, or that right hand looping punch that kind of has like a weird missile trajectory to it. It's not a straight shot, and it's not a whipping overhand right like a Tommy Hearns or a Shane Mosley type of right hand, but it's like this weird angle punch where it's like, like he's throwing it like that. And I didn't see him landing his most significant punches against Canelo Alvarez. So even after that first fight that... Man, you want to talk about changing the course of history with the way decisions are altered, right? By the time they got to the second fight, I'm kind of worried for Triple G thinking, damn, that first fight, even if I didn't think Canelo won it, it sure as hell probably emboldened him and would strengthen his belief in his chances in the rematch because Gennady Glovkin by this time is already in his mid-30s, so now he's getting into his later 30s. Canelo Alvarez is in his absolute prime. Now he's gotten more acclimated to the weight class. Damn, this might be even tougher than the first fight. And boy, <laughs> look, it, these were a tale of two different fights, the first versus the second. Both of them very close, but the second fight, Canelo Alvarez started taking the fight to Triple G to where we saw the former killer, Triple G, relegated, throwing like 100 jabs around to where he's becoming so jab heavy that he's throwing triple jabs and he's trying to like control and win rounds with the jab. Now, in this second fight, I thought it could have gone either way. I wouldn't have been mad at a slight close decision win for Triple G. I wouldn't have been mad at a draw, and I wasn't totally mad about a slight majority decision win for Canelo Alvarez. If this fight was in a vacuum, what hurt me as a fan watching Triple G get denied twice now against Canelo Alvarez was the fact that that first fight really shouldn't have, shouldn't have been a draw. And now you kind of get the sense that you're running out of time by the time you have this second fight with Canelo Alvarez, who, again, is fighting a more emphatic, spirited fight. 
at, you know, instead of the first fight where, again, he's like moving, trying to buy time by the middle and late rounds and kind of hanging on to what he thought was a lead that he built up, he being Canelo, built up early in that first fight. Canelo is on his front foot in that rematch, and they give him the majority decision win. And again, I thought... I thought the second one, if anything, I thought should have probably been a draw. <laughs> that's what the that's the way it felt watching the fight. Like this one could go either way, but Triple G walking away from two Canelo fights with a O one and one record in those two fights, that is so damaging to one's legacy. Because if things went the other way, which they very easily could have, we could still have an undefeated Triple G, even though I thought that two fights later, he fought Steve Rolls, knocked him out in the fourth round after those two Canelo fights, and then fought Sergio Derevianchenko. I thought Derevianchenko actually deserved a decision win over Triple G. But still, the legacy coming out of those two Canelo fights would have altered the reputation of his legacy. If, again, the, you get one scorecard going the other way, basically. But history has it as it has it. And now, you know, after that difficult decision win for Triple G over Sergei Derevianchenko, he fought uh, Camille Cesarometa, who we saw after getting stopped by Triple G in the seventh round, also get stopped by Jaime Munguia. Triple G beat uh, Cesarometa. He was winning basically every round. It's hard to say, look, I think that I've seen a diminished version of Triple G in these last two fights against Derevianchenko and against Cesar Meta. But when you're winning every, every round against Cesar Meta, it's kind of hard to definitively say that the guy's slipping. Like, he controlled the fight. Yes, it seemed like it took him a little longer than it should have by Triple G standards to get Cesar Meta out of there. But I don't think this is the same Triple G that we're working with today. And this fight against Cesar Romero was in December of 2020. So you add to the slight diminished state of a late 30s guy who's now about to be 40 years old, throw in like a year and a half of inactivity to go along with that. I don't know what we're going to see from Triple G going forward, but I do think that he's got enough to beat Ryota Murata still. Because styles make fights. Ryota Murata isn't a sweet science type of boxer who's going to make Triple G, you know, who's going to frustrate him with, you know, sticking and moving or coming with quicker combinations than what Triple G's throwing, unless again, it turns out Murata has faster hands today than Triple G has. I think Triple G is still the better boxer, still has an outstanding jab, still mixes up the attacks high and low. And Murata is kind of heavy footed. Like he in those back to back fights against Rob Brandt, he was marked, he lost the first of those two fights. Brandt won a unanimous decision in October of 2018. And then in the rematch, this was the high profile ESPN fight where Murata knocked Rob Brandt out in the second round. Brandt was like sticking to moving early, but Murata basically just kind of bum rushed him a little bit. Like he was just throwing power shot after power shot and he tried to get him out of there early and he got him out of there early. Rob Brandt for the life of him, like hold the guy, clinch, do something. I don't remember seeing one clinch from Rob Brandt after he got hurt against Murata. And Murata, if nothing else, hits pretty damn hard. And yeah, Rob Brandt was not equipped to survive once hurt against Ryota Murata. But you know, between those two Brandt fights, Murata was discouraged after that unanimous decision loss where he was considering retirement, unsure whether he was even going to continue a career. And then he eventually gets the rematch against Brandt and he again finishes him in the second round. He's had one fight since and that was in December of 2019. So look, Take all the inactivity that Triple G has had since his Scissor Meta fight and then add a year to that. And that's how inactive Ryota Murata, who still somehow holds that WBA super middleweight title because they elevated his status from regular champion to super champion when they stripped Canelo Alvarez from his super middleweight champion, WBA champion status. So that's how Ryota Murata was elevated from regular to super WBA middleweight champion. So what do I expect from Triple G versus Murata? I think Triple G, again, is still the better boxer. I think Murata is a good fighter, but he just, aside from that Hassan and Dam fight, which was towards the end, and it was definitely in the back night of Hassan and Dam's career. I don't know if Murata beats a prime Hassan and Dam, but between those two fights against Endem and then the two fights against Rob Brandt, 
he hasn't been fighting truly elite competition. So it's one thing to steamroll a Stephen Butler, a Bruno Sandoval in 2016, and Emmanuel Blandamura in, uh, via 8th round TKO in 2018. That's one thing. Now you're fighting Triple G, albeit a 40-year-old Triple G. So I think that Murata's style of fighting, the fact that he's not like a slick, defensive fighter he's pretty he's not that difficult to hit so he's going to be coming forward on triple g and i just think that gives triple g every opportunity in the world to finish the guy it's not like murata even stays low when he comes in like derevianchenko did when he was in triple g's chest remember those fights against derevianchenko and then like nine ten years ago against kasim uma where Kasim Uma was in Triple G's chest too, with the volume and the energy and activity. That's one style of pressure. But Ryota Murata's somewhat almost, not Frankenstein-like style, but definitely not anything that's showing too many levels of deception to then present that as a problem for Triple G. I don't see that being a stylistic difficulty for Triple G. I see it as being a stylistic advantage for Glufkin. So I think that Glufkin is actually gonna win the early rounds, and then I think he's going to really start hurting Murata badly by, let's say, like the fourth, fifth, and sixth round to where I, I, I think that Murata is going to show some heart and he is going to start pouring on the offense where I th do think that he might smack Triple G up a bit because Triple G, as he's aging, is becoming easier to hit, is becoming easier to time. The th one thing that makes Triple G great is his variance of punches. You, like, you think he's coming here, but it was really just a shoulder that he threw to then throw a right hand on top of that. He's got a tricky style. As powerful and as devastating as his punching power is, it's not just that as being a key ingredient to what makes him so great. But all of those non-punching power skills that, that Glufkin has developed over those years, you see those start to fade a little bit to where I don't know if this post-Abel Sanchez, because that was his longtime trainer, the great Abel Sanchez, I don't know if this post-Abel Sanchez, post two fights with Canelo phase of Triple G's career is going to still maintain those long developed skills but i still think that triple g is going to get a late stoppage of riota murata because he is still in my opinion that much more skilled than murata so i'm going triple g via late stoppage here the question is what the hell then happens if he takes care of business here and if canelo takes care of uh, business against dimitri bivel which is a big big question mark well we'll get to that i I've got a lot of thoughts on Canelo Alvarez versus Dim Dimitri Bivol. But if they do have a Triple G versus Canelo 3 or Canelo versus Triple G 3, I actually would... F my early thoughts on this would be Canelo probably via stoppage. And wow. Like, look, at least Triple G is getting this... will be getting a monstrous payday for his troubles. No, it's not going to spell well for his legacy. And yes, he did. He is kind of being, I guess you could say, Marvin Hagler'd out of being really put on the Mount Rushmore of all-time great fighters. Again, he didn't fight Kid Chocolate back in the day. There are a couple other guys he didn't fight, Dimitri Pirog, you know, back in the day. But he did fight Canelo twice. And if that instead became like a like one draw and one win for Triple G, and then he goes on and, you know, whatever he does after that, you're having a totally different argument about Triple G's career. But if he ends up getting stopped by Canelo in this third fight, so then he's 0-2-1 and one against Canelo, oh man, that would be rough to stomach. So yeah, I, I hope the payout helps. But yeah, let me know what you think about Triple G versus Ryota Murata. Who do you have winning and how? And how do you have this whole, you know, two-fight Canelo setup playing out? Like, do you think Canelo's going to stop Dim or beat Dimitri Bivol? Or do you think Dimitri Bivol, the champion, is going to pull off the upset against Canelo Alvarez? Let me know what you think in the comments. And please, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you were into the fight talk. I'm Wook. Thanks for tuning in.